as an editor in residence at, at Washington State University, DePauw, Brigham Young, University of Oregon, and Kansas University. He's been asked to be a Pulitzer Prize juror and member of the Nearman Selection Committee. He was a member of the presidential uh, debates panel in Cleveland, Ohio in 1980, questioning then um, President Jimmy Carter and Governor Ronald Reagan. He's a recipient of the University of Oregon's Distinguished Service Award and Oregon's Anti-Defamation League Torch of Liberty Award in 1986. He's been a member of the board of the American Society of Newspaper Editors and currently serves as its president. He has a distinguished career. We welcome him to the City Club today. Thank you, Ms. McWilliams. I'm, I'm a little worried about those questions. Uh, you have questions ahead of time that two people have already made up and they're going to ask me? Yeah. <laughs> I grew up in southeast Portland, and as a youngster, I read three newspapers, the Oregonian, the Oregon Journal, and the News Telegram. There was no television in Portland in those days, only radio. So the daily newspaper was the provider of news for most of us. It was then, and it should be now, an indispensable tool for spreading democracy. The newspapers of my youth no longer exist. Newspapers of today have been forced to change. Television has replaced the daily newspaper as the provider of news for most Americans. The children in the 1950s and 1960s, and to some extent the 70s, were raised on television. They have been allowed to sit in front of a television set and listen to someone give them the news while watching live pictures, sometimes of a news event as it happens. There were no printed words to make them think, and before they had a chance to get their thoughts together and to think about what they had heard or seen, they were presented with another sound bite. The technological changes in our lives are mind-boggling. Not only is there television, but there are the Walkmans, the computers, the VCRs, the disc players, and a host of other technical instruments to challenge and entertain our young people today. We can, make, we can wake up to electronic music or radio news, drink down coffee that was timed automatically to be ready in the morning, nuke a roll in the microwave, listen to a compact disc player while driving to work, correspond with other workers in the newsroom by electronic mail, call sources on the phone without seeing them, input the news story and then zap it to the editor. By the time it is noon, it is possible for the reporter in a newsroom today not to have talked to anyone face to face. Most of this sophisticated convenience machinery can be used to understand and serve a very different America from the one many of us remembers from our youth. But information from most, if not all, of the seminars I have attended on the future of newspapers in this country seem to show that technology for journalists is easier to deal with than the change in this country, the social change that has made this country aware of the multicultural society that it is today. The sociological changes have been brought on by a wave of immigrants who speak many different languages, which many of them will not always abandon, and who are people of color. The sociological changes facing this country today will eventually decide the future of America. Our democracy still is in the experimental stage, and the daily newspaper is the ideal tool again to spread the word of democracy and to use as a teacher for those who are not active participants in our democratic society and who are not true believers in the democratic process. It is important to remember just how much this country has changed since I was a youngster in southeast Portland and what role the newspaper has played in this change. There was no reason for me to believe in the 1940s that I could become a reporter on the Oregonian or any other daily newspaper in this country and certainly no reason to believe that I could become the editor. Newspapers then and today are under the direction of men who were then and to a large extent today the beneficiaries of a white male network. Anyone not a white male in our society but who worked in the news and editorial departments of our daily newspapers had to adapt to a white male environment. Until now, the American culture has been largely European-centered rather than reflective of the nation's growing diversity. Most whites live in different neighborhoods from minorities, go to different schools, and have different social lives. Dorothy Gilliam, a columnist for the Washington Post, 
and president of the National Association of Black Journalists, notes that while most whites have insulated themselves, minorities always have had to be bicultural and inclusive to get along with the white majority. Newspaper managers, editors, and reporters have been so involved in the technical revolution that is changing the industry that they have not given enough attention to the social revolution that is taking place and bringing about tremendous change in our country. What if the newspapers had used their resources as far back as the 1930s to expose the real evils of racial segregation in this country? Would we have the racial and ethnic divisiveness that we see all around us today? Newspapers and citizens face not only vast, but fast change, technological, intellectual, sociological, and in a world that needs understanding more than ever. Many of us in the newspaper business think it is our mission as an institution in this country to force change and bring about and, and better provide the intelligent information on which democracy depends. Let's take a look at what has happened to the newspaper readership within the last 20 years. Newspapers have been successful as a business despite the competitive challenges from other media, chiefly television. In the 1950s and 1960s, newspapers grew and prospered, and by the mid-1980s, most of them had achieved profit margins of 20% or more. And even in today's economic slump, profit margins for many newspapers remain in the teens. But while newspapers have been succeeding as a business, they have been less successful as a medium. Daily newspapers in the United States, the circulation of daily newspapers in the United States, rose slightly during the 1980s, from 62.2 million in 1980 to 62.3 million in 1990. However, the United States grew by roughly 12 million households over the same 10-year period. And while Sunday circulation increases have been larger, the gains in this area have just kept pace with the household growth. Meanwhile, the average weekday adult readership has declined from 78% in 1970 to 62% in 1990. And back to the business side, newspaper share of advertising dollars have dropped 4.4 percentage points since 1975, representing $5.7 billion in lost revenue. If the newspaper as we know it is to have a future, it must develop new strategies and have a clear sense of which readers and advertisers it wants to attract. And journalists must be active participants in this process because every choice the newspaper makes affects the, the news and editorial departments of that newspaper. In the past, we have taken for granted, and mistakenly, that the public at large still recognizes what Seymour Topping, a past president of the American Society of Newspaper Editors, calls the enduring institutional value of newspapers. And Topping points out that many of the younger generation, told nothing to the contrary, treat newspapers as media dinosaurs, shortly to be replaced by computer chips. Well, technology is pervasive in our society today, but I don't think it is as important to us in the newspaper industry as the structural changes in the lives of Americans. And I think these social shifts are more important to the newspaper than the change in technology. These changes include the household, which is smaller today than it was back in the 1970s and 80s. In 1970, 40% of Americans lived in households of two adults with a child or children. Today, a mere 26% live that way. The largest proportion lives in households of two adults, 30%. The couple is the most common household in the United States, and this has never happened before. The household most reporters think is large, the single parent with child or children, is only 8%. The assumption that the single parent household is larger stems from too much coverage for too little phenomenon. Today's new family configuration has restructured food, transportation, education, and the trend extends through all ethnic groups as society continues to make shifts with gradual declines in married couples and of households with children. The structural change also includes women who have moved out of the home and into the paid employment ranks. ranks. Today, the average Joe is a Jane who makes less than $20,000 in annual income. Americans no longer have that extra set of hands around the home called the homemaker. 
women in their 20s and 30s do not leave the paid labor force when or if they have children, and they outnumber men in college. Immigration and ethnic change is another major shift. One-fourth of the growth in this country in the last 10 years is in immigration. Children of different cultures, different values, different insights, different intuitions will change the mix of this country. What Jean Gaddy Wilson of New Direction for News calls a mosaic is coalescing in this country rather than a melting pot. When will minorities outnumber the majority in this country? It is coming sooner than later, and newspapers must be prepared to serve a readership that is truly diverse and multicultural. In New York City, where there are 119 languages spoken, minorities outnumbered the majority in 1992. In Los Angeles, where 56 languages are spoken in the classroom, the first grade classrooms have more non-European descendants than European descendants. In Houston, with 98 languages in its schools, the change is coming as well. A fourth ma major shift is the elderly. The so-called baby boomers will change aging in this country. They will become more prosperous than earlier generations because they are couples in dual earner households. The 45 to 59 year old group is up 40% while 18 to 34 year olds are a shrinking group in this country. What will happen in a technological age when other countries have young people. It is in the minds of the young that change comes. These changes in our society demand that the role of the newspaper change if the newspaper is to survive as a news provider and as a business. It may have been appropriate for newspapers to just report the news and comment afar on their editorial pages 20 years ago, but the world has changed much since then. Many of us have lost confidence in our elective representatives both on a local and national level. We are unhappy with our public school system. Our cities are a disaster. Our fear of crime goes unabated. The economy continues to be weak. Hate crimes, most of them aimed at people of color, are on the increase. Let me share with you some findings of New Direction for News, which is a clearinghouse for ideas and a resource for research, of which Gene Gaddy Wilson is the executive director. When a group of participants at a New Direction for News roundtable on democracy and demography tried to list ways traditional standards for a newspaper must change, this list evoked intense discussion and the participants could not reach a consensus for or against these challenges to tr traditional journalistic codes. And I want to list just 11 of them. One, sources should be shown or read stories about them. Wow. Two. Sources should have the opportunity to offer corrections or submit, submit disagreements. <laughs> Three, statements of disagreement will be published alongside the story. Four, journalists must be involved in organizations or the life of the community. Five, journalists must live in the subcommunities on which they report. Six, journalists should, should disclose all involvements. Seven, fairness and accuracy shall be sacrificed to timeliness or exclusivity. Eight, journalists should struggle against political correctness at all times. Nine, management should be made up of and hire people reflecting the community, using quotas if necessary. Ten, the editorial board shall be listed in the newspaper and explained. <laughs> eleven, editorial should be signed. And I could go on, but I just stop at eleven. That's, that's dangerous stuff. At another new direction for news roundtable, Newspaper staffs and editors were asked to redefine beats according to how important beats are to the lives of people. The participants suggested that beats could be developed according to the ways people spend their time and their money, or beats could be based on things people worry about. Balance would then be redefined as being relevant to people's lives. My point is, the news, that, is that newspapers no longer have the luxury of being traditional. They must be re they must redefine themselves to serve a rapidly changing world, and they are struggling to find and define this role. When I was a youngster in Southeast Portland, I could not identify with the newspapers I read. There were few, if any, people of color in the news and editorial columns with whom I could identify. Even on the entertainment pages and in the sports section, there were no role models with whom I could identify. No reason for me to believe that I could, that I could go to school and study to become a journalist. This country has lost too many gifted young people because too many of our institutions, including the press, were comfortable with their inclusiveness, the status quo, 
We are paying the price today for what we thought was a comfortableness of the past. It is not too late for this country to live up to its promises, and newspapers must be the instruments in bringing about the changes that would be beneficial to all of us. To quote Neil Pierce, a nationally syndicated columnist who appears frequently on the op-ed pages of the Oregonian, and I quote, it is no violation of journalistic integrity to place a premium on, premium on coverage suggesting how the local economy could function better, ways to bring quarreling municipalities together, and shared breakthroughs in infrastructure building, K-12 education, university curriculums, child care, and the criminal justice reform, unquote. Our industry probably will live with the reality that in the next years, newspaper readership will continue to be more selective than we would like for it to be. But there are a few strategies, but there are a few strategies in play to win younger readers, and there are signs that a growing number of parents, appalled by the quality of television fare, are, be, are being persuaded that the newspaper can serve as a vehicle to literacy. And if we do our job in reaching all of our readers, and in making sure that our newsrooms and editorial departments reflect the multicultural makeup of the new immigrants and minorities, makeup of our communities, the lives of the new immigrants and the minorities will be enhanced through better jobs and higher education. Doing our job will demand more of a commitment to a product that probes deeper into the community with more in-depth, analytical, and explanatory reporting. Reports to our readers that demand a sensitivity and a sophistication that we can't get by staying in our newsrooms and in our offices. Newspapers are better equipped than any of the other institutions in this country to forge change and bring a be and better provide the intelligence of information on which democracy depends. Jean Gaddy Wilson is right when she says, and I quote Jean, what is at stake is more than a set of business or slowing markets or even the institution of the newspaper. It's the opportunity offered newspapers by the information age to help the increasingly diverse international individual on one large landmass to understand the complexities of an evolving social shift and the decisions it will bring with it, unquote. Before I close, let me just say a few words about the Oregonian. I came to this newspaper more than 40 years ago. It has gone through tremendous change, and I've been a witness to this change. It was a good no newspaper when I came to it. It is a better newspaper today, and it will be a still better newspaper tomorrow. It is the largest newspaper in the Pacific Northwest, and along with the Los Angeles Times, it is considered to be the best newspaper journalistically and in its coverage of any newspaper on the West Coast. It prides itself in being fair and responsible and will continue to be fair and responsible, even in the face of criticism from those who disagree with us. It is accessible to readers, and it will continue to be accessible. It has held community meetings throughout the metropolitan area to hear what its readers have to say. It has invited people from all walks of life to talk to its editors and its reporters, people from the professional and business community, representatives of racial and ethnic groups in the community, and just plain readers in general. It has been aggressive in its coverage of news and will continue to, and will continue to be so but not to the extent that its coverage becomes unfair or irresponsible. Its staff is diverse and thus representative of the readers it serves. It can be better and it will be better, but it is up to you, the reader, to make sure that it is. Thank you. We'll start the questioning with Susan Stone and then Dennis Stencil, and then I invite other questioners to the to the uh, microphones. Ooh. Ooh. You, uh, you asked us at the beginning to envision what the world would have been like if newspapers had taken a lead, um, say, in the 40s against bigotry and issues like that. What's the Oregonian planning on doing in the future to um, help diverse groups get along together better in Portland? Well, I think some of that we're doing now with uh, a diverse staff, and we make sure that our staff is, is diverse. We're also out in the community, I think, more than we ever was, we ever were. Uh, we put a premium on local news, and I think the uh, bureaus that we opened up 10 years ago, a little over 10 years ago, in the Portland metropolitan area, and the, the Portland Bureau is proof that we are sincere in what we intend to do in the coverage of our news. 
I think the uh, best way to judge what the Oregon is going to do to make sure that this, this uh, city, uh, this community, this state, this region is a, a true and uh, equal place for all of us to live is to take a look at our news columns and see what the pictures are in the newspaper each day, including on our section fronts and on the inside pages, and what the articles are about. And I think uh, that will be the proof of the sincerity that, that we have to making this a better community for all of us. Dennis Stenzel, uh, Arts and Culture Subcommittee uh, of the City Club. Since Portland has become a one daily newspaper town, it appears that the drive for journalistic excellence at the Oregonian has been waning a bit in recent years, perhaps because of glitches in the new technology that you referred to, or perhaps simply because there is no competition. What are your thoughts on the responsibility of newspapers to maintain accuracy of reporting, clarity of expression, and observance of the rules of grammar and spelling? And what specific steps, if any, have been taken at the Oregonian in recent times to assure adherence to high standards in these areas? Well, you're right. It's technology. It's, <laughs> it's causing us a lot of trouble. <laughs> the machines never did know how to spell, and they can't punctuate. Uh, you're absolutely right. It's essential uh, that the paper uh, be accurate. And, and everything that it does, if we're to be credible. We have what we call a director of staff development, uh, a man by the name of Jack Hart, who came to us, uh, I think a little over 11 years ago from University of Oregon. Jack is in charge of making sure that that newspaper uh, not only is accurate, but that it also uses correct grammar and knows how to spell. Uh, we send our people from time to time to seminars throughout the country, and I'm, we spend a little bit too much money on that, but that's okay. Uh, I think that uh, with our staff development uh, director, there has been a lot of improvement, not only in our writing, but in the, uh, the coverage that the newspaper has given. And I would hope that that will continue to improve in the future. Barbara Clark, City Club member. Um, I wonder if you've considered being more uh, lenient in your requirement that the headlines fill a certain space. I've seen your copy editors work and they have a computer program that really limits what they can say just based on the number of letters. Uh, it's harder than haiku. And um, I think it would be more accurate if you let the reporters write their own headlines and didn't enforce this kind of um, graphic restriction. You're trying to cause a lot of trouble at the paper. <laughs> You'd put a lot of people out of jobs if you let uh, the reporters write their own headlines. Uh, we can't do much about, about the space restrictions, really. The, the pages are, are, are a certain size, and we can only give so much space to, to the headlines. Well, actually, your copy editors could still do the spelling and stuff. And um, just not forcing them to fill up that line could give you more accurate headlines. Well, we'll take a look money. at it, but I think the paper would be less attractive. If... My name is Linda Saifula. Mr. Hilliard, I'd like your comment on the dictum that the role of journalism is to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. <laughs> I'm not too sure uh, I can give a good answer on that. Do uh, you want to clarify that a little bit? Well, I, that's a part of our role. I, I think it's a role uh, that most of us play. I, I think most people in the paper, or on newspapers and in media today, tend to uh, look at the, the so-called underdog and, and want to bring that, that particular person or individual up to a certain level. And it's a role that I, I think uh, we play, and sometimes I think we play quite well. Uh, Jim Bocci, City Club member. You mentioned attractiveness, and that wasn't a term that uh, was brought up when speaking of newspapers in the past with the trend towards, I guess, what some people used to call the USA Today format, lots of sidebars, lots of color graphics. Um, the Oregonian has incorporated some of those ideas. Uh, m some of the more traditional papers, the New York Times, for instance, has not bent to that trend. Do you feel that that does, uh, do your numbers show that that has increased your readership? How do you feel about that personally as far as 
uh, looking at the traditional roles that newspapers play? I think the, the papers that you speak of, a number, you could probably count them on one hand, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, and the New York Times. And the New York Times is, is looking at color, and if you look at the book section now, it uses color in this book section on, on Sundays and more changes on the way at the uh, New York Times. We live in a competitive uh, world today, and television is a competitor for, for people's time. And television is very colorful. I think we live in a world of color, and our young people today have come up in color. I don't think there's any way we can go back to just, just plain uh, black and white. It doesn't mean that you sacrifice uh, the quality of your newspaper, but I think we, we, we have to compete with uh, other, uh, other um, media, and uh, television is one of our big, big competitors for people's time. I used to, uh, used to laugh at USA Today. I don't laugh at USA Today anymore. If, uh, <laughs> if that paper does one thing, and that is to get people to pick it up, regardless of what the little items are, how many it has, and, and the lack of depth, it makes people read. And I think whatever we can do to attract people to the newspaper, to get them to read, and hope that they turn the page of that newspaper to see the in-depth and the analytical pieces that are inside. I think we, we then are doing our job. And if we can get young people to look at the dining room table or the coffee table or in the doctor's office uh, at the section front of the Oregonian or any other good newspaper, and there's something on there that makes them pick it up and start looking at it, then I think we've, we've accomplished one of our goals. Mr. Hilliard, I'm Sylvia Dobbs, a City Club member. It seems to me that there should be a little stronger demarcation between news reporting and editorializing. Uh, my feeling is that news reporting would be sitting at the top of the fence and not taking a view on one side or another. And it seems like in the Oregonian, the headlines are very often slanted in one direction. And it, if they're going to take that approach, I believe there should be a, the, the uh, writer's name on the article. I very often see front page, uh, I don't know if they're news or editorials, but to me they look more editorial from the headline particularly. Would you give me some comments on that, please? Well, you're absolutely right. The uh, headline should not uh, be one-sided. Uh, and if, if you really take a close look at most headlines, if not all of them in the paper, they are written on the story. It, it represents something that's in that story. And if those stories are one-sided, or biased, as you put it, there would be a little bug there that says that this is an anal analytical piece or a news analysis, and that warns you that this might be biased. Uh, the news stories, I would challenge you that uh, their, uh, their objective is objective can be as far as fairness is concerned. They simply report what other people are doing or what other people have said. I, I just don't see that. I w if I knew I was going to speak today, I would have brought some examples. But uh, Feel free to, yeah. to send me examples if you, if you have them, and we'll take a good look at them and do something about them. Okay. Thank you. Jeff Carr, City Club member. This is Softball. With this improving technology that you discussed, as well as being far-reaching and aggressive in your reporting, why was the Packwood story broken on the East Coast? Why, why does everyone react that way? <laughs> uh, I, don't, I don't have any excuses for what the Oregonian did in the Packwood story, and I can give you my reasons why I think it was uh, broken on the East Coast. Although uh, I think most of you first read it in the Oregonian because we ran it the same day that the Washington Post ran its story in uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, we tried uh, for some time, over a year or two, to chase down the rumors that we heard about Senator Bob Packwood. Uh, we could get no one, find no one, including some of the people who talked to the Washington Post, some of the women who talked to the Washington Post, who would go on the record for us saying that they would, would support the information that we were hearing. And these are some of the same women who talked to the Washington Post. The only reason I can give for that is I think there are a lot of people who see the Washington Post or the New York Times as the or one of the national newspapers in this country. And I think they feel more safer and more comfortable as further away from home talking to those publications than I do to, than they do to the local uh, newspaper. In saying this, uh, that doesn't take away uh, at all from us being aggressive or more aggressive on any, any subject that we pursue or any story that we pursue. Uh, I would, uh, would challenge anyone to, to show where the Oregonian has, has failed to be aggressive on, on the Packwood story. The big uh, reference that we hear to being non-aggressive is what this gentleman said and that is that the story broke on the East Coast with the Washington Post. 
we could not find anyone, and I repeat, to give us information on the record that would let us publish a story that could uh, possibly ruin someone's career uh, without being able to back it up in court. Leslie Hildula, City Club member. As a business consultant, I look to the paper for insightful and uh, perhaps investigative approach to business issues in our community. And yet there seems to be inherent conflict because the revenues of the newspaper, from my understanding, come from advertising mostly. And how can we get then investigative journalism into like labor issues in department stores perhaps or fairness and selling issues in automobile distributorships when their revenue is so important to the paper? Trust us. <laughs> if you think that, uh, that we're influenced by advertising, I'd, I'd like for you to talk to Fred Meyer to Myron Frank and to Nike, just to name three. Uh, I, they don't share your view. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I can assure you that uh, the advertising department of the Oregonian does not in influence or try to influence the news operation of the newspaper. And there is a complete separation there. Although we meet with advertising people at the paper all the time, as well as we meet with production and business people at the paper. George Dysart, City Club member. I'd like to comment on her raise a question about what I've referred to as the balkanization of the Oregonian in their desire to get areas from the southeast or the southwest or whatnot. Many of us live outside the city of Portland and yet we come in here to work and we are in, involved with Portland activities. Uh, in my case, I live two blocks outside and I cannot get an Oregonian that tells what's going on in, say, the eastern part of the city and other parts, and, and instead they're making room for um, things out at Hillsboro or Forest Grove, or, which seems to be an attempt to drive the local newspapers out of business in those areas, but it certainly has balkanized the downtown editions. Well, there is no attempt to drive the local newspapers, those weeklies, out of, out of business in the uh, suburban areas, and as far as I know, they're all thriving. It is an attempt, however, to uh, get those readers into the Oregonian where we couldn't in the past because of space limitations. And we can do a better job of uh, incorporating the news that we think is of interest to all of our subscribers in the Portland metropolitan area and, and roundups, and we're working on that. We still think uh, all news that we feel is major appears in, the, in all editions of the Oregonian, even if you pick it up in Boise, Idaho. Uh, we make a concerted effort uh, in our news meetings twice a day to uh, discuss the subject matters that we think are of interest to everybody, and we make room for those uh, items in our newspaper. I'm Helen Cheek, City Club member. Uh, the Regional Society of Professional Journalists has established a Northwest News Council which handles uh, complaints from readers. It's my understanding that the Oregonian does not participate in that. Um, I, I would like your opinion and comments on the role of regional news councils to handle complaints. I think you're referring to a news council that was started up at the University of Washington, by a man up at the University of Washington, uh, and is sponsored, I think, by the, the side of professional journalists, Sigma Delta Chi. Uh, I, I'm not against a, a regional uh, or any kind of news council, and this council, I think, is called the Northwest News Council. And I'm not too sure whether we'd want to be a part of it. It, it'd be up to uh, the editors at the paper if they think it's something we should, should participate in. I like to point out, however, that we hold um, meetings with people who complain about our newspaper all the time. We also send out what we call accuracy checks to people, and perhaps some of you in this room have received them, in which we solicit your comments. Along, we send a copy of the article that was run that quoted that we ran that quoted you, or your or a story in your company or business or whatever. Then we ask you to comment on the pictures, the quotes, how you were treated by the reporters, and what have you. We think that we have uh, adequate safeguards for the readers of our paper to, to prove that we're going to be responsible and fair. If we join a news council, that's a decision that will probably be made in the future. That particular news council uh, was pretty much just uh, foisted upon us, and one day I remember getting a summons. And they gave me three court dates uh, in which I could appear because of a complaint from uh, a political figure who had dealt with us before and we thought we had given him the information that he wanted. That's about the only answer I, I can give you on uh, the News Council. 
Don Barney, member of the club. Uh, Bill, this is, question is about the editorial pages of the Oregonian and, and how they make a difference, particularly in public policy in this community. What three examples would you give over, say, the past 10 years where uh, the newspaper and its editorial pages have either led or strongly guided the community toward public policy improvements, changes for the better, uh, that have uh, stuck to the wall and have become part of, of how we uh, operate in this community? Um, I think one fairly uh, recent one had to do with the, oh, the Oregon Citizens Alliance campaign to uh, put a measure in the ballot that most people thought uh, would take away the, the individual rights of uh, some of the people in our community. But I think the one that probably stands out in my mind more than anything is uh, urban renewal, when we first started urban renewal in this, in this community, and what, ur what urban renewal has done to, uh, to this city. I don't know if I can name a, name a third one. My name is Peter Heuser. I'm a club member. It seems like about six months ago you hired a columnist. I think her name is J.T. Vader in the sports department. I wanted to ask you, I know that when she first started with the Oregonian, the paper took a lot of flack, at least in the letters to the newspaper, uh, complaints about the types of things she was writing about and her, and her perspective. I'm wondering, did you go out and recruit her in order to increase the diversity of the writers at the Oregonian? Uh, if so, would you do that again, or if not, is that something you might do? Well, diversity had, had a lot to do with it. We felt that uh, we were lacking uh, women in our sports department, and women were becoming more active in sports. And if you read the sports section of the Oregonian, we give almost as much space to women athletics in this state as we do to, uh, to the athletic uh, abilities of the males. Uh, yes, we deliberately wanted to find a... Uh, a woman who is a good sports writer and a good columnist, and Judy was our choice. I'm Robert Smith, City Club member, and I'd like to pass a commendation on to you. I grew up in Indiana reading Dan Quayle's grandfather's newspaper. <laughs> Morning paper, evening paper, and television. Uh, when my father moved out here in his late 80s and 90s, he was reading the Oregonian one morning and said, Robert, it's a different world out here. <laughs> we don't get news like this in Indiana ever. Thank you. Thank you. B.J. Seymour, City Club member. What do you feel is the influence of the tabloids that we see in the grocery stores on newspapers today? What, you, you want to give me an example? Of, uh, there are a lot national of Enquirer is the obvious one, but all the rest that are uh, National Enquirer imitators, you know, um, woman abducted by space aliens, those kinds of stories. What of influence, if any, do they have on, on uh, the daily newspapers? I don't think they have any, absolutely none. I'm a little, uh, l little hurt sometimes when I go to the supermarket and, and, w and watch the people picking those up, reading them while they're waiting to be checked out. I'm Ray Polanyi, a City Club member. Uh, uh, Mr. Hilliard, I believe you said earlier that democracy is in an experimental stage. I happen to believe with, uh, to agree with you, and, and I think that the bottom line is probably how we will reconcile independence and responsibility in information uh, with uh, what I would call the bottom line, advertising, uh, the profit motive, what have you. Uh, how about the newspapers in, in this context? Well, we're I not going to... The question was asked before, perhaps, but... Uh, we're not going to survive if uh, we don't make money and make lots of it to make sure that we're here. Is that, is that what you're talking about? Well, yes, but, but money, uh, profit, doesn't come without a string. Uh, it's, uh, it definitely uh, influences uh, what, what is turned out. I'm thinking of, and, and people will laugh perhaps, the automobile industry and the amount of money that is spent. Somebody said uh, in excess of $100 billion, uh, and, and all you need to is turn on TV and, and look at any, uh, any magazine, any paper, 
And, and it, it's clear that the automobile is, is a very, very pervasive force. And, and yet, I think many of us are being more and more convinced that it, it's a mixed blessing. Uh, are you saying say that the newspaper is a mixed blessing? No, the automobile is a mixed blessing. Uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, obviously, information and, and independence and reliability and, uh, and uh, unbiased information is, is very, very crucial. Well, well I hope how, that, how about the newspaper in, in that context? I hope that the Oregonian continues to make money. Uh, the Oregonian is owned by a family, two, two brothers own the newspaper. And I've been at that paper more than 40 years, and every year I've been there, uh, I've seen our staff increase, I've seen our salaries increase. Uh, not a year has gone by that an employee at the Oregonian, full-time employee, has not been a beneficiary of a raise. Uh, and, and yet I think the paper has improved tremendously. So I think the, the, the profit of that newspaper has benefited this community. This community is a better community because I think the Oregonian is a better newspaper today. Dale Annis, City Club member. Ray, glad to see you get something about transportation in there. <laughs> uh, I'd like to let you know that I'm one reader that would like less for more. Uh, I would pay $2 for the Sunday edition if I could get rid of all the trash that's in it. <laughs> and I'd probably pay more 50 cents for the daily edition if I could get rid of uh, all of the, most of the supplements that go in there. What's, what's the paper's reaction to something like that? There are not enough people like you. Yeah. And, <laughs> and we're going to continue to run uh, those advertisements and carry those supplements. Perhaps while others are formulating their questions, I have a couple of questions uh, from the floor. Uh, you mentioned the recommendation that uh, the editorial board be listed and its process better understood. Could you tell us today about people on the editorial board, who they are, and how you decide what to comment upon and how you arrive at your position? I'm not too sure I want to tell you that. <laughs> uh, for your information, the people who write the editorials for the Oregon are listed most of the time on the editorial page. We do not uh, sign our, our editorials. The editor of the editorial page of the Oregon is Bob Landauer, who has been at the newspaper uh, over, over 20 years. And uh, Bob's background, he's graduate of, U of Columbia University, and I think with a degree in economics. Surprisingly, there are a lot of people at the Oregon who do not have degrees in journalism. Uh, there are seven associate editors on the editorial board who write editorials for the newspaper. Uh, eight, if you want to count, uh, Mr. Landar. And then there's a cartoonist, Jack Oman, who is still just a kid, and his cartoons show it. He's good. I, I <laughs> he's very good, and he's, he's syndicated throughout the country. You see him in Time Magazine, uh, Newsweek, and other publications. And then there's uh, there, uh, the editor of the editorial, uh, the uh, forum section, and a deputy on, on in, the, in that section. Uh, we have two women on the editorial board and five men. Uh, one person of color on the editorial board itself and one person of color who's the deputy editor of the, of the forum section. Does that answer your question or did you want more information on them? They, they meet every morning, Monday through Friday at uh, nine o'clock and decide on any given day what topics each one of them will, will write. It is rare that uh, Mr. Landar will assign a topic to anyone. They generally pick topics uh, that they want to write on or they have some, some familiarity with. And almost every day the editorial board has visitors and uh, those visitors come from all walks of life. A lot of them are politicians. I think last, last Monday I think it was uh, Secretary of uh, Health and Education was in town, and she spent about an hour, an hour and a half with the, uh, with the editorial board. We also have two people, two full-time people in Washington, D.C., who frequently contribute to the editorial page or the op-ed page. And we have a full-time correspondent in uh, Tokyo, uh, Rich Reed, who contributes quite often to the uh, editorial page or the op-ed page. Uh, last but not least, unless we see other names coming forward, other 
cards. Uh, what changes can we expect with the new leadership at the Oregonian with the new editor coming on board? Well, I wish I knew. <laughs> uh, I think you are going to uh, see the newspaper uh, concentrate uh, more heavily than it has in the past on local news and local coverage. And I think some of that has been apparent already on page one of uh, the newspaper. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar, we, we went out uh, here several months ago to choose a new executive editor who would replace me as editor when I retire next year. And I think we picked the, uh, the best person we could find in the country, who happens to be a woman by the name of uh, Sandra Mims Rowe. She was vice president and editor of a newspaper in Norfolk, Virginia, which is an outstanding paper, the uh, Virginia Pilot. And I think you're going to see... Uh, this newspaper will continue to become a, a good newspaper, and 10 years from now, you will, you will say that it is much better than it ever has been. I'd like to ask you all to join me in thanking Mr. Hilliard. It's been a privilege to have, have you here, and we're honored by your career and your presence today. Thank you very much. Thank you.